folks, welcome back to another Throat Punch Lunch. I've got a great episode lined up for you. We are actually gearing up to go to Gamma and MeepleCon in Reno and Las Vegas, uh, respectively. And uh, I can't wait for next week, actually. Uh, this is uh, one of the coolest trips. I'm really looking forward to MeepleCon. Uh, that's a, just a great time there in Las Vegas after Gamma. So we are gearing up for that. But in the meantime, we do have some great uh, segments for you this week in Throat Punch Lunch. Uh, a lot of just uh, run-of-the-mill, I guess you could say. Uh, as far as the contributors that are here, we don't have anybody new. These are all tried-and-true uh, contributors, so uh, you're in for a good episode at the very least. You might even say, great. I know I would. I know that my segment is of particular interest because we got some really cool stuff in the other day and uh, they're accessories, different kinds of accessories for your games. So uh, I'm going to be showing some, the first batch of those off in my accessorized segment, uh, but I don't want to you know, belabor that point too much because all of the other contributors have done a great job on their stuff. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get to it. This is Ambie from Board Game Blitz, and this is Blitz Stop Mechanic, a segment where I pick a mechanism and then talk about games that use that mechanism in a cool thematic way. This time, I'm talking about area control. Area control is a mechanism where you get points for having the most units or something in an area. There's also area influence and area majority, which are lumped together with area control. I'm not sure exactly the difference between them, but sometimes you can have only one player per area and you have to kick the other players out, and sometimes there's multiple players per area. The obvious theme for area control is with wars and fighting for territories with your armies, like in Risk, which is a really popular game. But there are lots of games that use the similar type of theme where you're fighting over territories with your armies. I don't really like area control games that much, but there are some games that use area control with a slightly different theme that I actually enjoy. One game is Three Kingdoms Redux. Three Kingdoms Redux is set in th the Three Kingdoms period in China, where there was a division between the states Wei, Shu, and Wu. And there's fighting in the game, but the area control part isn't in the war. Instead, there's area control in the action selection in a sort of bidding war. To do actions like recruiting, developing, and getting your support, you have to send your generals into the action spots, and only the player who has the most power gets to do the action. I think this is really cool because it shows that control is important not just on the battlefield, but everywhere else when you're fighting for control. And I think this is also really thematic. Another game with area control or area majority is Adrenaline, which is a first-person shooter themed game. And in this one, what's interesting is the area you're controlling is the other players instead of a territory. Whenever you attack another player, you get to put damage counters on them. And then when that player dies, whoever has the most damage counters on them gets points. But there's a twist on the area control mechanism in Adrenaline because whoever gets the last shot on a player gets extra points. So there's a timing mechanism added to the area control. I think this is also thematic because in a first person shooter video game, you get points for killing someone. So getting the last shot is actually like the getting the kill. Even though when you think of area control, you think of fighting big wars and conquering territories, it can be used in other ways than just conquering territories, and that's what makes it really interesting. Thanks for watching Blitzstop Mechanic. Let me know if you think of any other area control games that use it differently. Hey y'all, it's Jay, and it's time to talk about your flare. On 15 pieces of flare, I'm going to show you guys some ways to spruce up that game room. 
on all the various different Facebook groups that I'm part of, I'm always seeing board game developers posting pictures of their games they're making, components they've got going on, artwork in the game, etc., etc. And every once in a while, one of them will really just capture my attention. And in this case, for what I made today, it's Dead Throne. The developer was posting pictures of different cards they had created. One was a dragon, one was a bandit, a goblin warlord, and some other ones. But everything just looked really cool to me and everything just really stood out. And it looked like a pretty well thought out game and card layout and all that stuff. So anyways, I got a hold of him. He got me a print of one of the cards and a map, but I'll be doing that next set, next episode. But for this episode, I got a hold of the Goblin Warlord card and I made a custom frame for it. So let's check out how I made this sweet frame. So for this project, we're gonna need a frame, paper, masking tape, silver spray paint, black spray paint, several fire tones ranging from yellow to red and including white a plastic bag, and an awesome piece of art. So go ahead and remove the glass, paper, and cardboard from the frame, then using the tape and paper, mask the back of the frame. Then in a well-ventilated area, spray the outer section of the frame silver. Once that's totally dry, mask off the outer section of the frame, being sure to completely cover the sides. Then you're gonna paint the inner section black and let that dry completely. For the next step, make sure to have your bag near and handy before you start. Once the black is totally dry, you can take your fire tones and apply quick and thick coats, starting with white, then the yellow tones, then the orange tones, and then the red tones. Do each coat in quick succession and do not allow any of them to dry at all. Then quickly grab your plastic bag and press the bag into the wet paint. Dab the bag all over the frame to create the fire effect. Once you have your desired look, you can go ahead and remove the masking now or wait until it's totally dry. Once totally dry and the masking is removed, you can reassemble your frame. Boom! There you have it. A quick and easy way to add some flair to your game room. Now this Dead Throne World of Velus is scheduled to hit Kickstarter within the next couple weeks. It's an open world RPG style game and they've put so much thought into it. Just the world alone has over 2400 years of history. I think that's pretty cool that they put that much work into just the world alone. Now. This is only the first game in a series of many that they're creating for this world of Velus. So I'm excited to see everything that they, that they end up coming out with. Now for the frame, I really like the way the silver and on the outside and the fire on the inside turned out. It's a pretty unique effect. I wish I would have done a better job masking up these corners, but I can fix that later. Hey, if any of you guys have any suggestions on games or ideas you'd like me to make into some flair, comments below. I read them every single time. Or you can go to my Facebook page, Peak Your Interest. Or Twitter or Instagram work too, at Half Handicapped. But, don't forget, 15 pieces of flair is the bare minimum. Some people choose to do more, and we encourage that. Have fun, everybody. Welcome to Throw Punch Lunch. My name is Bobby, and this is these totally geeky games where I make some recommendations for those geeky friends of ours with interests outside of our hobby. So, last week, at least as of the posting of this video, last week, really exciting news broke out. What's that exciting news? That the worldwide release for Marvel 
Uh, Infinity War, Avengers Infinity War has been pushed up. That's right. We get Infinity War a week or more earlier than we were um, anticipating. I'll put out the exact date down here somewhere. But that's really exciting news for pretty much the whole world because let's admit it, pretty much everybody has become a Marvel fan. And if you yourself or any of your friends are Marvel fans, here are the games that I would recommend. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole game, but actually of recommending uh, Dice Masters or if you can find an affordable copy of Marvel Heroes, going to pick that up or even the um, X-Men Mutant Revolution, which seems to be a game that only I like. Um, I'm not going to mention any of those. See what I did there? I'm only going to recommend one game, and that's Marvel Legendary. Marvel Legendary, a deck-building adventure, I believe it's called, is like the greatest, awesomest uh, Marvel game out there. It's great if you're a comic book fan. If It's great if you're just a fan of the movies. It's great if you're just a fan because on Saturday morning you watch Spider-Man or you watched uh, the X-Men animated series. It's great for all of that because it has characters from all of those properties in this game. Now, if you're going to get a bunch of these characters, um, you might as well pick up the base set and some expansions, right? If expansions aren't really the thing for you, I totally understand. But at least for this game, I picked up quite a few expansions. I'm not going to divulge how much I did pick up. But here's a quick kind of buyer's guide recommended recommendation list, at least in my opinion, of some of the cool expansions to pick up. One, I think you should pick up the Marvel Legendary Villains expansion. Even if playing the bad guys isn't really your thing, this kind of completes the game. And that from then on, every expansion that you would get from Marvel Legendary is compatible with the game. Marvel Legendary Villains expansion is great, but what about another big box expansion that really ramps up the game? Uh, I would pick up Marvel Legendary Dark City. Marvel Legendary Dark City is actually the first expansion that I picked up when I picked up my copy of Marvel Legendary. And so for now... That expansion and the base set really coalesces into one game for me. It's hard for me to separate it, but I did list out the cards that are available in both sets. And Marvel Legendary Dark City is really a great expansion. Um, by the way, at this point, if you've picked up both these expansions, you have more than enough cards, believe me. However, if you do want maybe one more big box expansion, um, I would go somewhere between the Civil War expansion or the Legendary X-Men expansion. Now, because I grew up an X-Men fan, I picked up the Marvel Legendary X-Men expansion, and I enjoy it greatly. Um, I'm really excited about it, and I'm still excited about it. I picked it up, like, last year, and I'm still really excited about it. So... That's the big box expansions I would pick up. I'm not going to divulge whether that's the only ones I have or not. But what about some little box expansions? What are some little box expansions where you could pick up? Um, well, Fantastic Four expansion, at least for the majority of the time that I've been playing Legendary, was um, out of stock everywhere. It was out of print. But now it's recently just come back into print. If you're watching this video much later and that's not really relevant information for you anymore, I'm sorry. But I do believe that currently it is still available in mass market retail as well as the Guardians of the Galaxy small box expansion. Uh... These are all characters that all work really well together as well. But the legendary uh, Guardians of the Galaxy expansion does change the game quite a bit. So if you're not really ready for it, I wouldn't implement it qu quite yet. But if you really have to play with Rocket and Groot and Star-Lord and Gamora uh, and Drax, I would put it in there and know that those characters quite change the game quite a bit. So those are the expansions that I would pick up. I'm not going to divulge if those are the, all the expansions that I have or not. Um, also, an interesting expansion that I would pick up, maybe a small box one, is Marvel Noir. It's an alternate timeline Marvel storyline. Um, go ahead and pick that up if you would like. However, those are the ones that I would pick up. Let me know in the comments which cards are your favorite if you've played the game already. And if you haven't and you're a Marvel fan or you haven't introduced all your friends that are Marvel fans to this game, go out and do it. It's really good. Everybody that I always introduce it to really likes it. Anyway, let me know in the comments which cards are your favorite. And if you have any storage solutions that are better than dividing all the cards that you have into a couple of the boxes, let me know. Because I really would like to know that. That's vital information for my life. Anyway, until next time, my name is Bobby, and this has been These Totally Geeky Games. I'll see you on the next Throw Punch Lunch. Bye. Welcome to Games Beyond the Board. It's a segment where we talk about games that are language independent or have very little language dependence. I've always been fascinated about Asia and Middle East, and I've been many times to the Hindu continent. So needless to say, I was very excited when Hutch decided to release Hajas of the Ganges. 
which is a game published by r and Game and Hutch, and it's for two to four players. And have a very unique scoring mechanic to win the game, which I really enjoyed. So the outside of the board has two different tracks. The money track, which runs counterclockwise, and then the fame track, the yellow track, that runs clockwise. In order to win the game, both your money and your fame has to overlap each other or meet each other. Once uh, the two tokens get to meet or surpass each other, you trick the end uh, round of the game. Now in case of two players get to accomplish that, whoever is further apart wins the game. Although you have a money track on the board, your main resource are dice. At first glance at the board, it seems very busy and seems there's a lot of going on in there. And it does, but in a good way. It's uh, not overwhelming as it looks. Uh, everything is well separated and each area is it's quite easy to get familiar after a couple rounds. As I said on the bottom of the board is where you acquire dice. Uh, you put a worker here to get it, orange dice, or you put a die here to get two different colors. In this case I'll put a blue to get two orange dies. At the top of the board you have your karma. And what it does, you can pay one karma in order to flip your dice to the opposite direction. So 4 to a 3, or a 3 to a 4, and so forth. And the, be the more karma you have, the more times you can take these actions. On the opposite side, you have the building area, where during the game you'll be able to upgrade your building so you can score more points at your market. At the quarry is where you're going to acquire dials. So you place your worker on one of the spots here, and then pay the amount of money that is shown there. So I would pay one money, and then I use my dice to buy uh, tiles. So I'll put this over here and take the six tile, and then we'll place on my board. When I visit the market, I generate income from that market. So I can put a worker over here and generate an income from three different markets. You would, if you have more than one of that market, you just choose the highest one, and then you take one from each one, uh, whatever income that specific market will give you. The top area of the market, you would place your worker there, and then you would have to give up one of your die, let's say I would give up my six die, and then I would generate income for that specific market multiplied by the die that I gave up. So at the harbor, you would place your worker in there, and give a one, two, or three die, and take the amount of movement that's showing on each one of those spots. Uh, the first one is free, but if I had another player in there, I would just have to pay one money, pay the die, and then move my boat. When you visit the palace, you can take different actions by giving gifts to the noble, which will be represented by a different number of die. So if I do a die number one here, I'll take the first player token, and we'll move my track to on the fame track. You also get a bonus on the money track when you stand or pass the 12 mark on the money track. So the first bonus is going to be the river bonus, so you, can, you get to move one space on the river track. Then you flip it over, and on the next time you pass the 33, you get two dives, and then you flip it over, and so forth. Rise of the Gunji is a really fun game. It's probably one of the best work placements I've played since last year. Uh, it proves that you don't need to have a light game to be language independent. You can have a nice complex with a lot of rules and it still be very uh, language independent. And that's it for me today. I hope to see you guys next time on Beyond the Board. Have you ever wondered what games you should keep or you should lose? Find out here at Welcome to Purge Reviews, where we take two games, keep one, and get one out of here. Today we're going to be looking at Photosynthesis versus Toporary. And what you're going to have here is two games that we'll be taking, we'll be placing things on the board, but looking at the height of them and deciding which one will score you the most points. In Photosynthesis, you're looking at more of an economic game, where you're looking at the economy of the sunlight, where your trees that you build will be able to garner sunlight by the placement of the sun that moves around the board. And as you have these sunlight points, you'll be able to spin those to put seeds or grow your trees or cut down your trees and score points. In Toporary, you have a 5x5 five five grid where you'll be placing a meeple on the board, and then you can exchange one of the tiles to score you points. 
In photosynthesis, you have this whole push and pull about whether you want to keep your trees up and blocking other people, or if you want to maximize your points by cutting them down now and getting the most amount of points. Because every time you cut down a tree, it's worth less and less. In topiary, you have this abstract scoring system that will be utilized based on the placement of the topiaries throughout the tiles and what your meeples can see. Photosynthesis really gels with the theme more. You have the 3D components that look fantastic on the board. And when you're growing a tree, it gets bigger. And you can visually see that. And you can see the sun move around. In topiary, it really feels like you're just playing tiles. It feels a lot more abstract. Why are you scoring these and why are you doing this doesn't make a lot of sense thematically. I feel like topiary gives you the better decision. So during the game, you'll be placing these meeples and you can't place it where somebody already has been. So there's a little bit of blockage in that. But you'll be deciding when you pick up these face down tiles with your hand, which one you want to place and how you will score the most points. And sometimes no decision is your best decision. The problem I have with photosynthesis is you only have so much light. There's only so much you can do. And you need to get those trees up to the four in order to cut them down to score the points. So I feel like getting those trees built up as quickly as possible is the strategy to go. And cutting them down would be one way to score points. But if you cut them down, you're no longer getting as much light. So there's a push and pull to kind of cut them down towards the end of the game when things are settling down rather than earlier in the game. And I feel like that became a set strategy for our group. Both games have a lot of player interaction in the form of blocking each other. In Topiary, you'll be blocking people in the view that they want and putting out the Topiaries to block them from scoring. But I feel like in Photosynthesis, it's a lot more cutthroat. You're going to be placing trees, leaving them up just to block people. You can see the rotation of the sun, and blocking people is a large portion of this game. At least when we play, I felt like blocking people was almost as important as what I was doing on my turn. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, I feel like Photosynthesis is the more cutthroat game of the two. If you like that kind of gameplay, then you may steer yourself towards Photosynthesis. Although Topiary also has it, I feel like you have more options to kind of minimize that cutthroat nature of the game. Overall, I feel like Topiary is the better game. We'll go ahead and get rid of Photosynthesis right now. Boom. Because I don't feel like it can stand up to Topiary. Although I know Photosynthesis is a very popular game, a lot of people like it. For my taste, it just didn't have the strategic decisions that I wanted. Hey folks, welcome to another Accessorize! I got a lot of stuff in here today, and it's really neat stuff from a company called Game Mat. They're based in Prague in the Czech Republic, and they sent a whole lot of really neat stuff. So I'm going to show you a little bit of it today, and then we'll get to the rest in the future. Let's get to it! So this is going to be kind of like one of those boring unboxing videos that Tom does, where uh, we just kind of open all these guys up, take a peek, and then go from there. Let's see what we have here. Ooh, styrofoam. Maybe I should explain a little bit about what this is. Game Mats does, uh, it's a website where they have pre-painted terrain. Now, of course, you see all of the different, um, oh, it's making a mess. And so this is a temple. As you can see, it has all of these angels all over it. And uh, these little, I don't know what those are called, made out of gold or something with some, you know, the steps, and this is all the styrofoam stuff. But anyway, really neat looking temple. So uh, this is a pretty neat thing. I like this, it's uh, heavy duty. Um, it's definitely not lightweight, of course. I wouldn't be privy to dropping it from any uh, given height on any kind of hard surface. But as you can tell, it is good work, good detail, and it'll look pretty cool once we get some miniatures playing around on it. Now these, if I'm not mistaken, are the 4x4 double-sided mat. And so you have this on one side, where it is like a road with grass and that type of stuff, and this is the neoprene. And then on the other side, you have this grassy battlefield kind of 
setting. So of course, four by four is not gonna fit perfectly on this table, but there you get kind of a good idea of what the mat looks like. I'm gonna zoom in just a little bit so you can see a little bit more of the detail that goes into the mat itself. So it's pretty cool looking. I like it a lot. So you can see the detail that's there. So these really look good. I'm very happy with the quality. Let's get a different one out. And here we have the quarantine side of this mat. And this one is, again, it's one of those things that's pretty neat looking. And again, this is just a, a drop off because it doesn't fit inside the table that I'm using to uh, lay this out on. But as you can see, it looks pretty neat. And this is, uh, again, their 4x4 four four double-sided mat. This is the quarantine side. And then this is the Badlands side. So it's kind of just a rocky terrain that uh, can be used for a number of different kinds of miniatures games or as a background for whatever game that you're playing. So uh, it's really neat. And then this one is the Highlands in War side of the the next battle map that is in here. And as you can see, it's just a really detailed, um, worn battle side area. It looks really neat, very detailed. And then this one is the Winter Realm. This is very similar to the one we already saw, the Forgotten Realm one that had a road and a lot of grassy uh, parts on it. But this one is, of course, the winter version of that same battle map. And finally, the last map that was in this box is a double-sided mat for the Fallout Zone, which is what you're seeing here. And again, this is just the curvature of the table here the fallout zone so there's a lot of bomb craters and debris and that kind of stuff and then on this side we have the imperial base uh and so this is kind of a uh i guess you could say a sci-fi setting uh could be used maybe for other things as well but i definitely see it as a sci-fi type of board and i think it's pretty cool as well very high quality. Well, there you have it. Just a little tidbit of the stuff that GameMat.eu sent us. Uh, to use for Dice Tower purposes, we're going to be doing some reviews of them and that type of thing as well. Showing them off, giving you an idea of what they look like, how they feel, uh, how it is to use them and all that kind of stuff. That's for later on in the future. I was just really excited because all this stuff came in today. And so I was just kind of frothing at the mouth to try to get this stuff open. So really, that's about it. You can go check them out at www.gamemat.eu. And uh, like I said, they are based in Prague, Czech Republic. Uh, but they do have different portals uh, on their website for the different uh, countries that you'll be shopping from. So uh, it'll change the prices for you. You won't have to do any conversions or anything like that. That's one thing that I did really think was pretty cool. There's no guesswork involved. So that's about it for Accessorize this time. Let's get back to the rest of your lunch. Hey everyone, this is Tim Jeanette the Metal Meeple and this is the Budget Board Game Breakdown. So the game I want to highlight in this episode of the Budget Board Game Breakdown is a small card game called Oh My Goods by Mayfair. You can see it comes in one of those like normal size card game boxes that they have. Um, the game pretty much comes with a ton of cards and then a rule book. But there's even more than this set off to the side. And the game's pretty simple. You start off with a production building. Everybody starts off with the same one, but it requires different resources. And it's going to produce one gold of uh, coal for every card on it. We start with seven coal on it. And then each player gets a worker. And this worker could be used in two different ways. Now, what's going to happen is everyone's going through the game kind of at the same time. The first thing is the sunrise. And you can see the cards are used in multiple ways. During the sunrise set, we're going to use just the resource here. Otherwise, you can use it as the full card. Or the third way is you can place it face down as a resource on top of a building. So... We're going to flip over until we have two of these half suns. And then those are the resources that are also available to you in addition to the ones in your hand. 
Now we know we need two brick and a wood. There's only one brick and a wood. We have another one in our hand though. So we're going to build what's called efficiently. Efficiently means you're going to produce two resources onto that card. Otherwise you can build sloppily, but it, and it negatives, it negates one of the resources required. So we'd only need one brick and one wood or two brick and no wood. In this case, we're going to build efficiently because we know it's going to, we're going to have the brick to do so. In addition to that, you're also going to choose a card to go face down if you want to build it as a second building. Then each player is going to wait for the next round of cards to come out during the sunset. And we keep flipping until we have, there's one sun, there's two suns. And then in this part, everybody takes turn order. So starting with us, we've got a brick, we've got a wood, we're going to spin a brick from our hand. This one's actually discarded, the others and the, the resource, the sunrise sunset stay there for other players. And then we're going to produce efficiently two cards on top of our building. In addition to that, we're going to be able to chain. This one chains with wood. We can take any wood from our hand and place it on here, but we don't have any. Lastly, we would build our building. This would cost us eight. Since this coal is worth one apiece, we would discard eight off the top of this deck. And that would be our turn. The next player would go. And this would continue. We would do this all over again until one player has built eight buildings worth of buildings. And then each player gets resource or money for uh, resource <clears throat> money, victory points for the shields that are on each building. And that's pretty much the game. The game is pretty simple. It's a, it's a very, you know, you churn out buildings, you turn out resources, and you do it over and over and over again. The game's about 30 to 40 minutes, depending on how many players you have. And overall, I think it's a really fun game. Uh, the only real concern that I have, and other people have too, is that sometimes you can, depending on the cards you get, you can just spearhead eight cards, you know, eight buildings. You can only build one around, but you can keep building the really cheap ones and then finish the game a lot sooner than other players can build the heavier buildings. Fortunately, though, in the dozen or so times I've played this, that's not really as big of a concern. Maybe if you're playing with really highly competitive people, that might become more of a, uh, a prevalent thing to worry about. But overall, I think the game is pretty balanced, and it works out just fine just playing it casually, or a little bit more than casually. The game does have an expansion. Uh, the expansion I haven't played, but I do own. It has like this little five-part mini like story thing that you go through, and you can play it single-player and stuff. So I'm looking forward to that. But I think this is a great game. I, I really enjoy it. I mean, it's something that's real small. And I really like games where the uh, cards can be used in multiple ways. This one you can use as a building, or you can use it as a resource, or even just the face down on top of stuff. It just, it, such a smaller deck of cards can be used in so many different ways, and I really enjoy games that do that. The second thing about this game I also like is the game progresses all the players at the same time. You know, everybody's going through that sunset, everybody's going through that sunrise, uh, well, in the other order. But, you know, I'm saying it's kind of, and then, then you have that player turn order. It doesn't seem like one person's taking that much longer on their turn. So, really enjoy this game. Uh, if you know of any other games that kind of play like this, let me know in the comments below. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments below. Or you can email me at timgenet at gmail.com. Follow me on social media. Check out my podcast, MeepleCore. And until next time, keep on rocking and rolling dice. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Cardboard Herald's Rook and Record here on Throat Punch Lunch, and today we are talking about records. Well, I mean, every episode of this we talk about records, but in particular we're talking about why records today, because I get that question now and that, what do I like so much about records? And I listen to music on all types of media forms, but there's something admittingly cool about records, and, and maybe it's the physicality of it, and the collectability is something that I really enjoy too but I think it goes a little bit deeper than that it's a it's a sentimentality a, a connection to our past you see what's cool about records is they carry marks of every time that they've been played every time they've been laid out on a turntable and appreciated by people hungry for new music well that's a needle scratching on it wearing it down those hisses and pops they're like old friends coming to visit, whether they're put there by me listening to them or by unknown strangers who have owned the records in the past. And that's really cool. And something that I think that you could appreciate is true of some board games too. You see, board games, when done right, get a lot of play. And sometimes that means that they're going to get a little bit of wear. And this copy of Seven Wonders has been loved more than any other game that I own. The point is, is I kind of 
dig this copy of Seven Wonders because of all the marks of all the amazing games that have been played with it. What's cool about Seven Wonders is that even though it's been over seven years at this point since this game came out, nothing's really toppled it. Nothing has really outdone Seven Wonders. It is still iconic. It's approachable. It's interesting. It's complex, but it's also just simple and elegant. And that's true of another type of wonder. And it may seem really obvious, but I'm going with another record that has been put through its paces, probably listened to more than any other record in my collection, and that's Stevie Wonder's Songs in the Key of Life. Unequivocally, this is a masterpiece. A double disc album that has so many songs that are ingrained into the American songbook at this point that even if you've never heard them before, you will recognize how they have been referenced throughout pop music history for 40 freaking years, and it still hasn't been outdone. This is an incredibly audacious, <laughs> ambitious album on Stevie's part where he wanted to explore his creative limits, and he put himself through the paces in order to come up with something that's expressive and complex, deep and rich, yet still so incredibly approachable in a beautiful, catchy pop shell. Now, I know you're telling me, why are you having me listen to this funk rock R&B soul album while I'm playing my games set in historic antiquity? And I promise you, it makes sense. Not only is there like a cyclical groove to this album that feels appropriately thematic and also tonal in nature as you're shifting all these cards around, but also Stevie pulls on all kinds of types of music going as far back as classical music to integrate in sophisticated and complex ways. So just like Seven Wonders, it's approachable, it's fun, it's catchy, but it is also deceptively deep and incredibly brilliant and yet at the same time so unmistakably obvious yet still has not been paralleled. And that is why Stevie Wonder's Songs in the Key of Life is the perfect record for you to listen to while loving on your copy of Seven Wonders. So what did you guys think of our pick? What are your games that you have put through the absolute paces? And what game do you want us to rook and rectify next? Let us know in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching the Cardboard Herald's Rook and Record. We have all kinds of other stuff on our channel. We got reviews, recommendations, rooks and records. And of course, thank you so much for watching Throw Punch Lunch. I've been Jack Eddy for the Cardboard Herald. And the more that we do of these, the less bad music you will have to suffer at the table. I got a card hanging out of this thing right now. <laughs>
you have coins in the game that you can use to buy various cards and some of these cards will give you the giant monsters and they immediately just kind of arrive on the map and join your army and you can go around rampaging which is great uh, but one of the things I really like uh, apart from all the fantastic miniatures in terms of mechanics is the system down here gives you different areas that you're fighting over each round so you're not necessarily just trying to conquer any old territory uh, you can see there are certain flags marking certain territories only the territories with the flags which are summarized down here are the ones that are going to um, give you points effectively if you win them you're trying to win as many different territories as you go through the entire course of the game as possible if you win the same territory round after round after round it doesn't really get you very much you get a lot of points for getting a range of different territories which is great mm -hmm. because it means if you've just won a territory there's no real incentive to stay there so people are constantly moving around the map trying to grab other territories so it feels very dynamic and i really like that mm -hmm. about it yeah, and the order in which the territories trigger is different. The, tr the territories don't trigger when someone kind of moves into another place. If blue moves into a place where there's red troops, they don't fight. They fight at the end of the season. And they fight in the order. So this one fight first, that's number one, then number two, and number three. So you can kind of plan your resources accordingly based on which fight you think the best, you're best going to win. Do I want to put all my resources into number one, knowing if I do, don't do very well there, I might struggle to win other ones. Mm -hmm. And the way you do that is with coins. So coins are used for buying cards and building strongholds, and any leftover coins you have are used for fighting. So effectively in this game, what I really like about the game is that you don't need the most troops to win the fight. Uh, or at least you don't need the most troops to benefit from being in a fight. You can do other things. So you can you do it in an order, so you do this and this and this and this. And what happens is each person secretly behind their screen puts some coins on these cards, and the person who puts the most coins in each individual section gets to do it. One of them is commit Harry Carry, effectively you <laughs> kill yourself off for victory points and you increase your honour. One of them is to take hostages. So if you think the other person is going to beat you in troops, if you take some of their guys hostage before you actually get to the fighting bit, you actually beat them. You can recruit soldiers and you can kind of bid for points for the most figures dying. Um, you can't fight your ally, but you can contest regions really well using coins. That's the bit I really like about the game. Yeah, I like the... Um this on the system sorts all ties and there's a lot of ties mm. so that's really important it makes a big difference in the game yeah there are various ways in which you can go up or down potentially on the honor track so you might wonder why you want to kill your own troops but you actually your honor increases quite a lot if you kill your own troops it's a very honorable thing to do and as you say <laughs> that breaks every tie in the game yeah. it is huge and a bit like blood rage there are certain cards that allow different things to kind of combo together so sometimes you might be able to get a card where you get more points for your guys dying. So killing your own guys is an even bigger incentive to do that, and you spread lots of little guys to try and join in every fight and try and get your guys killed every time. And um, so it gives you different strategies to do apart from just trying to build up the biggest army. Well, we've been board game opinions, and this has been our flavour of the month. It's Rick Haney from Epic Gaming Night, and this is why it's there. We take a look at a game in my board game collection and look why I've kept it on my shelf. Today we're going to be taking a look at a miniature style war game with a board, and that is Badlore Second Edition. This uses the command and color system where you have these cards that you draw and they're only going to let you attack and activate units on certain flanks. I really enjoy how the board is set up at the beginning of the game. You both have cards where you play your half of the board and then set up the terrain. And then it's really interesting because it's not just about like attacking and taking out your opponents. There's special like conditions that can get you extra victory points. You're racing to get to 15 victory points and whoever gets there first will win the game. But there's also these objectives out on the board that you're trying to hold down. And it's more about figuring out how to strategically take those objectives and get more points than your opponents than it is about just wiping out other people's units. So as long as you're able to, even if a bunch of your guys die off, as long as you're able to hold down those areas longer, you'll be able to take out your opponents. I really love the lore that this adds to the command and color system because it has all these lore cards and you have lore that you're gaining and you can spin that lore to be able to cast different lore cards that'll give you all sorts of abilities and sometimes they can help you catch up if you're behind or you can save it up and do some crazy combos on some of these cards which is really cool as well. I have spent a lot of time painting up the miniatures for this game and it's been a lot of fun. I really love that there's all sorts of different crazy fantasy monsters in this game. I really love the undead but I'll play any of the factions just because I love playing the the, the Dakon where you get to do the cool little eagle guy that's flying around and then you have like the, the siege like ballista creature or you can play the Athuculon where you have these crazy demon guys or I love the little beetle guy that comes as well. Um, there is 
lots of expansions for this game and it's pretty much out of print at this point, but it's a game that I love. You can find it really cheap some places. A lot of times people have had it on their Christmas sales and things like that, and I feel like the stock is getting sold off. It's crazy because it's such an amazing game. And um, I've definitely had a lot of fun. I made my own custom board so that way we can play like Overlord, like epic style play. So we've played like like three on three with this game before where each person like one person would control the left and one person would control the center or person would control the right and you play this crazy gigantic epic game of battle lore so we kind of like make up our own rules for that sort of thing but we pretty much follow the memoir 44 overlord system and kind of do it the same way and just have tons of units out on the board for a gigantic epic game of battle lore so i've had tons of fun playing this game and i wish there was more out there for it but the stuff that they have out for it already is a ton of fun to play and it's easy to teach and get people into. So Battle Lore Second Edition is definitely a game that I'm gonna keep on my shelf. Maybe someday I'll actually get all the miniatures painted, but nonetheless, I love Battle Lore Second Edition, so make sure to check it out. What's up, Throw Punch Launch? It's me, Brian Drake. Again, two episodes in a row. I know it's crazy to think that I actually managed to get the episode in in time, but it's been uh, it's been good. I've actually managed to be able to pull this off. Again, if you heard me last time, talking about a crazy schedule, uh, we're slowing down a little bit for the spring, so it's nice to have a little bit of a break. We've been all over the country, all over the, uh, the world. We just got back from London for a conference, so that was fun. But uh, here we are, Throat Punch Launch, and you know it's my segment, my favorite thing to do, it's my favorite thing to talk about, stuff I like, stuff I hate. Now, last time, it was just stuff I hate because it was about a topic that was super controversial. And thanks for your feedback. I do appreciate it. And a lot of great comments, both good and bad. Uh, everybody was respectful, which brings me to today's topic, stuff I like, stuff I hate. The internet, stuff I like. First of all, obviously, this. This is going to you because of the internet. If you didn't have the internet or we didn't have the internet, this wouldn't be happening. There would be no Dice Tower, for instance. There would be no Throat Punch Lunch. So the first thing is that, the fact that we're able to do this because of the internet. Also, plus sides of the internet as it relates to board game hobby. You see a commercial for a great new game and you go, boom, let me go check this out, BGG or whatever. You see a quick ad pop up for a new Kickstarter coming. And it's great how quick and instant the information is about a new game. You say, hey, I wish I could contact the creator and ask him a question. Boom, shoot him a tweet, shoot him a message. It's just that easy. And that's what's so great about the culture we live in with today in the internet in the board game hobby. Now, I can't imagine going, what I do, for instance, uh, has totally changed in the last 15 years because of the way marketing has been. I wasn't in the game when people had to go look at phone books and look at uh, maps, you know, actual atlases to find out how to get to where they're going. Uh, when I do this traveling that I'm doing now, you know, we just punch in our GPS and boom, it tells us where to go or we hop on a flight. You know, it's just so much easier. But uh, the same thing for the internet. The internet has changed the way we do the gaming hobby, which conversely leads me to stuff I hate. The internet. Yes, that's right. Stuff I like, stuff I hate is the exact same thing today because the internet allows anybody to make any kind of comment, which is fine. I'm all about freedom of speech, but without any kind of recourse, without any kind of uh, accountability, you can say something super annoying or controversial. I know those two aren't necessarily equatable, but super annoying, super offensive, super con controversial. And then you slip back in like a squid ink, squid, a squid inks away into anonymity. And there's no recourse. There's no accountability for it. And I hate that sort of thing. Uh, you know, there's a lot of problems with just the, the arguing and silliness and the outrage. Internet outrage is the most annoying thing in the world to me. We, you know, we have to outrage about this thing. Why? I'm not really sure, but this person's outraging about it. So therefore, I've got to outrage about it too. You know, just follow kind of that sheeple mentality a little bit. Not a fan of that, you know. Not a fan of how we, we can, you know, <laughs> and it's hard because you can dislike something. Uh, and you can vehemently dislike something and post that in a way, and that's fine. But then you can also like something, and instantly you're gonna comment about how you're stupid and you you need to quit uh, reviewing board games, you need to quit playing board games, you need to go back to playing Monopoly because you don't know what you're talking about. So there's a certain boldness that the internet has given us that is actually cowardice disguised as boldness. And so that's one of the things I hate about the internet when it comes to the board game hobby. So that's me, Brian Drake, with Stuff I Like, Stuff I Hate. Check me out on Twitter at the latest Retro and on the uh, Dice Tower for more reviews. Until then, we'll see ya.
Hey gamers, this is Liz Davison from Beyond Solitaire, and I'm here to bring you another episode of Solo Thrash, a mere thrash gaming for those of us who like to play alone. For the past couple of weeks, I've been dealing with the joys of having bronchitis. So I don't know about you guys, but when I get sick, a lot of times it feels like my brain is active and wants to do stuff, but my body just cannot keep up. So this week I want to talk to you guys about some easy solo games that you can kind of play on and off uh, or, you know, on a lap desk in your bed so that you can still get a little bit of gaming in while you are also ready to pass out and not fit to, p- to play with other people. So for sick day gaming, I'm obviously going to recommend games that don't have too many components and that can be played in sort of a contained area. So one of the first comfort games I would recommend for a sick day is actually Legacy of Dragonhold. I discussed this game a couple of weeks ago on Solo Thrash as part of a piece on storytelling games. And Legacy of Dragonhold is basically a text-based choose-your-own-adventure game from Fantasy Flight. So what that means is that there are very few components. There are no dice. There are no chits. There is no board. All you have to worry about is tracking your adventure on a couple of adventure sheets and reading the information that's contained in the quest book. So for me, this makes it pretty easy to pick up where I left off if I kind of want to take a nap in the middle. And it's also just very relaxing because there's not a whole lot of components to keep track of. In a similar vein, I would also recommend Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective. This is a game where you are joining Sherlock Holmes in an attempt to solve various cases. And you do that by reading the newspaper for clues and reading through a casebook that contains reports from people that you interview as part of the case. There's also a map, and you can play by the hardcore rules where you're trying to race Sherlock and see if you can be the most efficient mystery solver. But I never really like to play that way anyway. I just like to sort of soak up the flavor text and drink some tea, which makes it really great for just kind of sitting on the couch or sitting in your bed because you're not feeling great. Um, The other side benefit is that even if I've played some of these cases before, trust me, take enough cold medicine and you're not going to remember anything. Another game that I've enjoyed during this particular bout of being sick is actually Limes. This is an out-of-print game, uh, but you can still get it for a pretty reasonable price on the geek market, on BoardGameGeek. It is basically just a tile-laying game where you lay down a card, place a meeple or move a meeple, and try to score really high. It's like Carcassonne with just one person. So I like it because the cards are in a four by four grid and that grid is actually small enough to fit on a lap desk. So I have been able to enjoy the game while sitting on the couch or sitting in bed and not sitting up at a table just because it's so small and compact. And that's something I've actually really appreciated this time around. Being sick is never fun, but I hope that my solo gaming suggestions have helped you brainstorm how to feel like a little bit more of a person, even when you're not feeling that great. Hopefully though, we're all well and happy this week and happy gaming. Hey everybody, Even Steven here. Last week I ran a promo contest and the winner of that contest was Jason Spiker. I'm gonna get your mailing information and send those out to you, so I'll be in contact with you. This week, however, we're gonna look at Meeple Plinko. I made a Plinko set out of meeples in a shadow box that I use for game day to choose what game we're going to play. So I'm gonna show you how I make it and maybe what you can use it for. Let's get to it. Okay everybody, this is the finished Plinko sack in which I have a tray in the back that allows me to send dice down so we get to pick the picker to pick the board game. So let me show you how this works and how it is made. The first thing you want to look at is the size of your shadow box. You can purchase these at craft stores. This one is 15 inches by 20 inches, but you might want a larger one for a large gaming convention, or you might want a smaller one depending on what your playgroup prefers. The shadow box has a indentation area in it so you can fit stuff in it, which works very well for a Plinko DIY. The next thing you need to do is cut a piece of foam board to leave a gap to allow the dice or whatever object a ball that you're trying to get down there through the Plinko board. So this size can uh, vary depending on what you are sending down in your Plinko board. So you're gonna cut that out 
and through these little hatches that slide over, they will keep your foam board in place. You also wanna cut out a hole at the bottom to allow whatever it is that's going into your Plinko board to exit. I also came up with foam board and hot glued this on that allows different slots for different things and you can flip this up. This is just glued and has a piece of tape on the back to allow this to sit. And when I wanna send something down in the Plinko board, I just lift it up and it goes right down in. The next step was gluing on the meeples. So I had hot glue and I just glued them on. I glued two on so that way the item that had to go down, in this case the dice, would have to go down the chute all the way to the bottom. Spread them out evenly and once you organize them in any pattern that you want, usually the object will go down in a random pattern. Sometimes you might have to add things to the side to make sure it funnels it towards the middle goal. Another thing I added were these slots that are just pieces of foam board hot glued on that funnels it right down into the hole so that it goes out the back of the shadow box. I also created a funnel piece out of foam board that is the exit of the Plinko board. So when you send something in, whatever comes out the bottom comes right in the tray there and you can lift it out and see what it was. And that's Meeple Plinko. On the front, you could maybe use vinyl letters or stickers that you can apply and maybe put the name of your game group or the event that you're running. For our group, what we use it for is to choose who picks the next game. So we use a dice, check my game group video for that. Otherwise, you could use this maybe for an event or charity or to pick to see what happens when it comes out, who comes out first. There are many different uses you could have for this, but I thought it was pretty neat that it's board game themed that we could use at events. So that's how you make Meeple Plinko. Okay hey guys, that's my Meeple Plinko set. I hope you found that cool and easy and maybe you can use it for your game day. Let me know in the comments below. What are some other cool uses of a Plinko board that you could use for game day? We'll see you next time, guys. You're having a scrumptious lunch. This is Luke from the Broken Meeple with the starting tile, the source of new and different gateway games for the hobby. Now, I'm gonna take that word new a little bit with quote unquote this time round because we're gonna go back in time to 1994 when a game called Manhattan won the Spiel de Yaris. Now I don't tend to subscribe to this whole cult of the new type thing, you know, where everybody's all obsessed with the new hotness, the new glossy exterior, and with Kickstarter it's more like cult of the unreleased. And I prefer to look at the older games now and again. Now I'm not cult of the old per se, age does not dictate whether a game is good or not. But with this one, Manhattan, it is a classic gateway game where you are building skyscrapers on these various cities on board in order to have the tallest tower, in order to have multiple towers, in order to have ownership of multiple cities. You are essentially choosing at the start of a round, and there are four rounds in the game, how many pieces of tower blocks you want to build. You've got tower blocks ranging from one, two, three, or four levels high. You pick these before the round starts, and then you have a hand of cards where you'll play a card, and it has a grid reference, a sort of grid map on it, where with a highlighted square. And that means that in a particular city, you can place a tower block on that square. And the idea is, is that you can only place a tower block if it's an empty square, if it's one of your towers already, or if it makes, if you, you can place it on the opponent's towers, if the amount of levels of your color you have is equal to or more than theirs. So you, tower blocks are constantly changing ownership. At the end of a round, there is a little bit of scoring where multiple towers will get you points, where having control of multiple cities will get you points, and just having the tallest tower will get you points. You rinse and repeat this for four rounds, and of course, the one at the end, let me guess, the most victory points. Of course! This is one of those games I can get behind that back in 1994 when it won, it deserved to win. Because this is about as clear cut a gateway game as you can get. The rules, I kid you not, I literally got the game out, knew nothing about it really apart from rumors, read the rules, it's about two to three pages worth of rules, 10 minutes, I was gone. You know, literally already we're playing with four people. I didn't have to know anything or read it in advance. You can pick up this game and go. You see it at a board game cafe or somebody just gives you it as a demo copy. You don't have to worry about someone teaching you the game. Nope, just read the rules. 
literally will take you less than 10 minutes to re-absorb and get on with the game. The whole glossy exterior of having vibrant colours on the board is appealing, as well as the translucent plastic towers. Although it can be a little bit niggling to count how many levels are in a particular tower, because it's not entirely clear on the tower block how high it is. You kind of have to look up close. So, colourblind people, you might want to beware and stay away from this game. Turns are lightning fast, but you have tactical decisions about where you should place your tower blocks and which towers you should take control of, because you're going for majorities and you're going for height. And on top of that, the cards will, dip. you have a hand of them, but you only have so many. So you have to think about which blocks you should aim for. And at the start of a round, when you're picking the blocks for each round, you're thinking, should I get rid of my little ones first or should I get rid of some of my bigger ones? You have more little than you have big, but you're gonna have to use them all eventually. So do you start early on the small ones or do you leave that till later? Do you get some big ones out to have dominance? Or do you run that risk of, oh well I'll put a big one out and then somebody else just basically nicks the tower off me and has a tall tower. But the one caveat I will mention is that this can be quite a mean cutthroat game. You are stealing towers from people left and right, you are stealing control, you are actively in each other's faces. So if you're not comfortable with mean games, you might want to steer clear. But we're not talking like survive, escape from Atlantis level of meanness. There's just enough little cutthroat ability to hear the odd from another player but the game is lightning quick and even with four players can be done in less than 60 minutes. So the meanness is not really a massive hindrance because you, the game is over by the time anybody really holds a massive grudge. So Manhattan, cheap, quick, easy, a little bit of meanness, not too long, literally a pick up and play gateway level game. If you've never heard of this before because it was too old for when you came into the hobby and you want to get into something that's a bit more of a classic by today's standards, then check out Manhattan by Foxmind, newly released and definitely worth your time. That's it for me on the starting tile for this Broke Punch Lunch. See you next time. Normal service has indeed resumed for the Broken Meeple. So I'll see you then. Take care and enjoy your lunch. So that's that for another episode of Throat Punch Lunch in the books written down. And so thanks so much for joining us. We do appreciate it. You guys are the reason why we do what we do. Of course, we enjoy it, but we also take great appreciation when somebody else uh, likes what we do as well. So we thank you for watching. I want to thank all my contributors for putting out the great work. Some of them at uh, their own personal um, health and expense. I'm looking at you, Liz. Get some rest. Make sure that bronchitis is completely gone. And then uh, we'll welcome you back. But uh, I just, I just want to give a shout out to her because she made a segment even after still getting over some of that bronchitis. So that's the level of determination that my contributors have. And I, that's why I'm so appreciative of it. So thank you to all of my contributors out there. Now, as far as those accessories I showed you, be on the lookout because we're going to be doing a lot of more different videos for them. They're going to be showing up in some some of our life plays and all of that good stuff as well. So keep an eye out for those uh, cool little things. And hey, thanks again for joining us. We're going to go ahead and get out of here. See you in a couple weeks on the flip side. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff, in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.